Members organization, hope all is going well. Uh, Brad Stevens uh, coming to you here with a mentor session kicking off. I um, apologize, it's been a little time since I've, I've gotten a session done. Things have been a little bit uh, crazy over the last uh, few months for us. Um, but uh, but happy to jump to jump back in. I'm excited. Actually, just last month we just hit 304 employees uh, with our with our business, and um, just uh, we're targeting about 600 uh, this year. So it's uh, been a crazy time, and seen a lot of good activity happening for for all of you. Um, but love these sessions, and, and glad to get back, and we'll get back on on cadence uh, to answer your questions and support you. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, Brad Stevens, uh, founder and CEO of Outsource Access. We provide a vetted and trained virtual assistants in the Philippines for business owners. Um, small to medium business all over the world, uh, virtual staff and operations, marketing, finance, uh, and all different categories. Uh, we're kind of unique in that we actually hire them as full-time employees in the Philippines, so we provide health insurance and benefits uh, kind of once they've been with us. Um, and, you know, have dedicated VAs as well as, you know, over 200 specialized support talents, you know, supporting them. Uh, and we're just super pleased. Um, we're supporting every industry kind of imaginable, and uh, it's just an amazing journey. Um, building this company, we, and we got to over 300 staff in just 22 months. Uh, so everything that I share with you, I live and breathe in terms of scale, automation, strategy. Um, I'm huge on frameworks and using systems and processes that, that are out there, everything from EOS to Jim Collins to Culture Index, which I'll talk about. Because um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of great frameworks and systems out there uh, to, to, to grow. Um, so love being a, a mentor uh, for all, all of you. And we'll jump into some of these questions, and hopefully it can uh, be helpful. All right, name of submitter is Ari Brown. Question asks, how do you fire a client when your only basis is that they're difficult and not willing to change? Uh, business description, CPA. I was hired just to clean up their QuickBooks, and they insisted on doing it themselves going forward after the cleanup, and they uh, undid the entire cleanup, and it's like talking to a brick wall when you try to explain anything to them about QuickBooks or any accounting concepts. Mine and my bookkeeper's fear is that because she's local, uh, she's just going to post like some negative review when she's the one that screwed up everything we did if we let them go and don't just fix it again for free. So I'll say that, yes, firing a client is something that, that you will get more comfortable doing um, <laughs> as you are in a more of a place of, of leverage. And I'm, it's, a, it's actually, I reference it. Um, and I'll say necessarily fire, but you know, determining what's being able to be selective on who you work with or, or, or not, because as you find, there will be certain clients that you can just be massive energy vampires and, and aren't a fit. Um, now, early on, you know, when you're growing and trying to build your business, you know, it, it's it, it's kind of tough to be more selective, right? Um, you need the income, you don't want the negative reviews, uh, so it's it's something that you kind of have to you know navigate in the early stages. Um, but as you grow and Financially and, and um, sustainability of the business is something that you can be a little bit more aggressive on. So what I would suggest, though, is to make the mental shift um, instead of, I mean, I know it's frustrating. Um, and you may not be in a place where you can you know, fire the client, but use it as a learning opportunity, right? See it as a way to find a way to avoid the future. Um, use it as education and a valuable experience. Um, maybe look at what's happening and just really document every single thing kind of do at the, at the process. Um, and just to maybe improve your screening approach, take a hard look at, at yourself and your approach to see how do we get to this place, right? How do we get to this, this mess up? Um, and so as you're dealing with the frustration of having to navigate all, all the challenges, say, look, I'm just using this as a learning opportunity. You're documenting everything so that you can avoid it, you know, in the future. And, and frankly, be thankful for some of these as well, um, because sometimes you have clients that aren't going to complain or not have issues, and maybe they just silently disappear or disconnect, and they don't give you an opportunity. Um, and so, you know, as a growing company, we have these come up from time to time, and I tell our team, let's look at them as a learning opportunity. Let's get through it. It's frustrating. Let's take care of the client, but l let's not let this opportunity go that we do not fix our processes or create a filter, um, you know, ahead of the game. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that I've done, for example, in, in our business and sales is we have a sales video. So if you go to our website on outsourceaccess.com and you click on get a virtual assistant at the top, you will see a video that we make everybody watch before they engage with virtual assistants with our business. Um, and it's been one of the most powerful things I've done for our sales process because it does a couple of things is, A, it answers all the questions directly from me as the CEO and the founder, um, and I can articulate and address versus having to happen with a salesperson on the phone. Um, you know, 90% of the, of the Q&A that people get about working with us, um, about time zones, about competency, and, and all of that. 
Um, so I get to pre-answer all those questions. So when they do have a call, and a lot of them watch that video and then purchase and engage with our services right afterwards. Um, but if they want to book a call, then the call is really just about dealing with the questions of their business because all the typical Q and A's that a person spends on a sales call so many times, the first 20 minutes repeating the same things over and over again is addressed right up front. Um, the second thing it does in terms of your case as well is it helps to filter out people that are not a good fit. If they're not willing to watch that video and understand what our process is and what we're about, and, and then they're not, they're not patient enough to, to even get a, get a VA. Um, you know, and, and for, for us, that's how we help avoid some of those crazy shiny ball entrepreneurs that just, hey, I want to be ADD and scattered all over the place. And, you know, I want to start nine different things and someone to kind of clean up messes behind me. And I just want a VA to come in and just help me, you know, uh, you know be, be this brilliant visionary that I am. And, and entrepreneurs are good, brilliant visionaries, the good ones are, but they also know that you got to have system and process. Um, and if you're going to work with someone in your organization, you got to be able to communicate what's needed to kind of work hand in hand so that we can be effective in providing them with the VA, you know, kind of going forward. Um, so does just some, some insights on it is that yes, it, it, if it's painful enough now and you want to go ahead and make that disconnect, certainly makes sense to do so. Um, but if you're in a place where you can't from an income standpoint and you're worried about kind of the negative reviews, just use it as a way and say, yep, this is a learning opportunity. This is a learning opportunity. <laughs> um, and try and get on the other side of it and make adjustments, you know, accordingly. All right, next submitter is Kathy Lee Quash. Uh, question she asks is, finding the right person and creating the right process to train them as my number Two, business description and background. I've been in the mortgage and real estate industry for 20 years, and I built a niche reputation for myself, so I don't have a problem generating business. What I need help with are A, finding the right people to delegate things off my plate, and B, creating a workflow, systems, processes, where certain aspects can be broken off for delegation without sacrificing integrity of file. And thirdly, uh, how to process, uh, how to better pass on knowledge that can only be passed on through on the job knowledge, tricky credit, income qualifying scenarios. Um, so first of all, Kathy Lee, I'd say it's fantastic that your head is, is in this space um, because you, you'll never scale otherwise. Um, and it is profoundly freeing. So many entrepreneurs and business owners, they, they never break out of that gap. That's why that's only 4% of businesses do over a million dollars a year. Most people don't realize that stat, but I mean, only 4% in the United States do over a million dollars a year because so many get in that trap and they just, you know, when I speak on this, I kind of talk about it as a kind of a growth ceiling that the businesses as they're growing, um, you know, they just hammer this growth ceiling where there's a cash, people, resource, system constraint, and they just deflect off of it. Um, and having the mindset and willingness to get to that other side is, is rare uh, for people to want to engage that. And a lot of them want to do it, but they don't actually take the behavior changes to, to make it happen. Um, they're still in that constant frenzy state and, and, and frankly, in my personal opinion, some of you have heard me share, um, is I think it's a, a bit of a chemical issue in our, in our body. I mean, if you think about, um, you know, the fight or flight state that, that humans get into, right? Um, there's this chemical cortisol that kind of dumps into your body. And, you know, I'm not, not a doctor, physician, but I just think that entrepreneurs kind of live in that state a lot and, and business owners. And when you have that chemical drop into your system, you, you kind of almost get used to that right? And your body kind of stays in that and it's hard to break free, you know, from that loop. So first of all, um, great that you're kind of in that, in that mindset. Um, and I can speak to this. I mean, actually we, we, uh, our largest client in the, in, in the, in our virtual assistant business actually has got 65 VAs with us. They're in the financial services space. And we're, we got a team that's doing nothing but loan documentation processing for them and doing all the, the loan documents and handling all those uh, processes and a whole other team that's doing, you know, lead generation and qualification as well. So, um, been, uh, familiar with that space. So the first thing I would say is just first take the time to brain dump and always tell people to, to do this when you're going down, down this path is it, but before, you know, finding the right people, I know is a key part of the question and then the workflows and the systems and the processes, but just, um, Try and do a full brain dump and, and answer these two questions. You know, what am I doing that isn't the best use of my time, which you can already have some of that identified. Um, and then how many hours per month you're spending on that task. And maybe it's also, if you've got some team members you want to help with delegation, what are you doing that's not the best of your time and how many hours per month? And literally, and I'll share with you a Google template. Just put the task. What's the categories it in? Is it an operations thing? Is it a marketing thing? 
you know, define the categories for you and how many hours per month you're spending on that. And it is amazing. I've had hundreds of companies that I've recommended to do that, simple exercise. And it's amazing how many hours they're actually spending on stuff per month that they didn't, you know, kind of realize. They're like, oh, maybe I spent a couple hours. But once they really didn't audit it themselves, they found it was a lot more. Second bucket to answer is what are things on the radar that you want to be getting to that you're not getting to due to time, money, or knowledge constraints, right? And these can be, you know, everything from, you know, hey, I've been meaning to clean up my QuickBooks to I've been meaning to, you know, overhaul our website. I've been meaning to get testimonial reviews. I've been meaning to get video testimonials. I've been meaning to get more social media content. I've been meaning to use LinkedIn. I've been meaning to anything that I'm meaning to is if you haven't due to your time constraint, right? Either or financially, just not time to invest in it or just knowledge, right? Like I'd love to be doing more LinkedIn, but I just don't know how to go in there and figure it out. I just need someone that just knows how to do it and can, can help me with it. So I'd recommend just doing two of those two brain, brain dumps for you and yourself and just get that full pack list in front of you and then really take a look at it and prioritize because you know, you're not gonna be able to outsource all that stuff right, and delegate it to someone tomorrow. But what are the things that have the highest ROI, right? That, that can have the biggest impact on the company if you get those off of your, off of your plate or your team's plate. And that's a good place to now really isolate sort of what are the things that you're needing to, to get off and that helps to then shape, right? What's the type of person or resource you need to kind of plug in and therefore the workflows and processes. Um, so I would start with that. As far as your question of finding the right people to delegate things off of my plate, right? Just set a high bar from the beginning, you know, and, and I mean, even in our business, I mean, we provide, you know, virtual assistants, you know, out of the Philippines for business owners all over. Uh, but I mean, we treat it. I mean, it's funny when people hire VAs with us, they see our process and how thorough it is. Um, and they're like, man, I don't even use this for my employees, which is crazy. You know, people just, they don't set a high bar for people a lot of times. And it's like, ah, I read their resume and a couple of references and my gut feel says they're going to be a good fit, right? There's too many amazing tools out there to not use to help you be more effective, uh, you know, with this. Um, so like in our business, I mean, we do IQ testing, emotional intelligence testing, disc profile testing, their ability to do project management, English and, and grammar proficiency. I mean, we have all these assessments and we provide them to a client to, to look, to consider them as a VA. They see how they performed on all of this, including a video they have to shoot at themselves about and, and presenting and showcasing, you know, who they are. So when you set a high bar right from the very beginning of the individuals that are going to be a good fit and what you're looking for is important. Um, and when you're looking, depending on the types of tasks, it's if it's an operational administrative type of stuff, look for those characteristics and whatever assessments that you're using, right? If it's disk profiling, one thing that we just introduced as well is called culture index. Um, uh, it's a little more pricey. You kind of work with a consultant in the process with it, but it's been phenomenal. Um, we do it, people go through this assessment and it shows exactly where they are going to be strong in the business and where they're going to be super weak. Um, do they need high, high attention to detail? Do they need to be able to be self-directed? Um, and so use assessments, um, you know, if, depending on kind of what you want to invest in it. I mean, DISC is obviously a very good one. Strengths finders is a very good one. Um, Colby assessments are, but choose one that you're comfortable with. And everybody has their personal preferences that you use as a standard in your business and use that as a reference point. The other thing is it makes the data be the bad guy too, right? So instead of you subjectively deciding if someone's good or not, you know, personally, you use that as the framework. And we've actually got a template. And in Culture Index, there's 19 different kind of archetypes. And we know exactly sort of what is going to be a good fit from a VA standpoint. And when you go to hire people, they fit in those categories. And we're doing the same thing with clients as well to kind of match them up. So just set a high bar and, and just, like I said, it make them write cover letters, have intensive interviews, make them shoot a video of themselves and explaining who they are and put them through those assessments. I'll share a link with you to a lot of those assessments. There's a bunch of free ones that are out there as well that you can use. As far as creating a workflow of systems and processes where things can be broken off for delegation without sacrificing integrity of file. I don't know what integrity of file means there as far as just maybe as far as security. Um, I, I would just say one thing, and this addresses your second question as well, or your third one about how to better pass on knowledge. Um, uh, is, is using a platform uh, like Trainual. I know uh, Sean is a huge fan of it. I mean, we, we have it fully integrated that we're engaged with and recommend it to clients that they don't have it. But it is a web-based workflow platform that will, will help help you get all your processes unpacked out of your head um, and couple that with like screencast recordings as well, screencast-o-matic. Uh, Trainual's new version, I think, actually has screencastings built into it. So you can actually record screens and save them as part of the workflows, which makes it so much easier versus trying to like bullet point out a bunch of stuff. Um, Another great tool for that is useloom.com. It's another screencasting tool if you want to use that. Um, but 
it's a great tool that helps you walk through, right? N nobody likes to sit down and just like write a bunch of, a bunch of workflows and processes, but these tools like Trainual um, do a really good job of walking you through, asking the questions and pull out of you what those workflows and processes are. So you can then create them, document them, and even create templates. So if you got a new client onboarding process, you create the entire workflow. And when you have a new client, boom, you start at the beginning and the person that's doing it just kind of runs through that whole process. We have VAs that do a lot of that type of work for, for clients and manage onboarding, um, you know, assessments and so forth. And so we use that tool for it. Um, so yeah, those are kind of the key things I would I would share on, on that on that side of it. And, and, and certain passing knowledge, it can only be you know through on the job knowledge. Um, you know, again, I, I would just capture instead of like having to have like a, a shadowing or role playing session, like record things. Um, you know, I know there's certain things that are kind of on the job, but most of those can be recreated and, and do a video, right? Like doing screencast recording, you can like create a PowerPoint presentation or, or even you can record a video like this um, and just walk through those. Like, here's a tricky credit situation that you get. There's five different tricky credit situations that we typically get. Here's what they are, right? And then screencast, walk through it, explain. Here's number one. Here's number two. Here's number three. Um, you can create a whole arsenal of videos for, for training and you can automate all of your training and your onboarding processes very, very efficiently and even address things that you think may need to be like on the job that you can really systematize and document. Now, there's always going to be those one-off random things that come up and you'll just have to deal with those on the fly. But if you're a good job of capturing and documenting, most of that stuff can be done in a, in a saved platform. Next question, uh, Heather Brockman Question, which is better for onboarding training, a private YouTube channel or trainual? Business description and background. I'm in the process of redoing my onboarding and want to add training videos for all aspects of the SOP. I didn't know if a private YouTube channel would be better or something more detailed such as trainual would be better suited for a company wanting to get a franchise level. And they offer high-end holistic grooming experiences for busy pet owners whose animals are part of the family. Um, I'd say hands down on, on this. Um, I mean, it sounds like, first, you, you have a visual element to showing how to do certain grooming. I don't know what elements. There's certain training parts that are administrative within the business, right? Maybe about how to go in and, and do things within, you know, your, your, your software platforms, you know, how to log in and, and book their hours or, or how to, you know, uh, you know, log a sale or anything that's administrative and stuff like that. I mean, trainual, you know, hands down. I and mean, we, like I said, we, we adopted it in, in, internally in our company. Um, and unless it's purely visual, like you're actually demonstrating how to groom or something. Um, and you can also take those videos and embed them in trainual. So you can create trainual as far as the workflow and a training and, and a process you want people to kind of go through and then record the videos, right? And you can embed them in trainual. Now you can actually, in Trainual, I believe, and you can actually shoot the videos and host them on YouTube and just put a link to them in Trainual if you want to. And Trainual actually just integrated embedded video hosting, I think, as well. But um, you, can, uh, you can embed those. So I would use Trainual to organize it, the process. Because you can always create a YouTube channel, but that doesn't, you can't put people through a workflow in YouTube, right? In Trainual, you can say, hey, here's your training process and what, the, what needs to happen. Then they go through it. You can see their status, how they're progressing, and so forth. And you can embed videos and so forth as needed in there. So that one's uh, pretty straightforward. Next question is Gabor Ratz. Hopefully I said correctly. Question, what are some quick wins I can implement to increase our bottom line profitability, and how should I go about doing this in the long term? Background. And business description is throughout the past two years, I've been focused on growing our top line revenue. And this year we're on track to hit a million in sales. Congratulations. We've been profitable all the way, but I feel there's probably a lot of waste we could eliminate. Normally I'm the sales guy, not the savings guy. So I'm not sure how to get started as well as how to make constant awareness of our bottom line an integral part of how we do business. We currently have a full-time accountant who can get me any reports that I need. Um, so first of all, um, congratulations on, on where you are and, uh, and to be thinking about this because a lot of times that are sales guy type mentalities, they just keep driving the top line and you know somewhere there's going to be profit that gets accumulated and they cut deals and do discounts and what have you and just never take time to look at the bottom line and realize that you know it, they may have a false sense of exactly what their profit margins are and, uh, and what the actual cash position of the business is. So the first thing I would say is get clarity on, if you can, what are the target profit margins for your industry? Um, you know, usually there's some standards out there. Um, so if you haven't done so already, is just really trying to get a benchmark and understand. 
what, what are the ranges of the target profit margins for your industry? Um, and then try and beat them, uh, you know, and use that at least as a reference. You better minimum should be hitting that, but see if you can, you can, you can hit them. Next thing I'd say is set up your P&L with true variable versus fixed cost structure that, that's aligned for best practices for your industry. Um, is, you know, a lot of businesses, they, they don't separate those out appropriately, right? And understand what is true fixed cost, things that are going to exist every single month, regardless of the revenue you, that you drive, right? That's going to be obviously your rent, your full-time employees, and so forth. You have some that are semi-variable costs or, or semi-fixed costs, but you know, really in your accounting, your bookkeeping, I know this seems very simple, but it amazes me how many business owners have been in business for years and years and years, and their books are still a mess and how they set up their P&L and their chart of accounts. Set up your fixed expenses in a way so that they're isolated. Um, again, you may be doing this, but if not, um, separated from your variable expenses so you can really see. Because at the end of the day, right, you want to maintain fixed and you want to leverage that fixed as much as possible um, without having to add additional, you know, fixed. And then what are your variable costs that go one-to-one -one with every dollar that's spent, right? Um, everything from merchant fees, you know, you have to pay your two and a half, three percent on every single dollar you sell commissions and so forth, and really get an understanding of where, where you stand. So what is your gross margin? So revenue minus your variable cost, know what your gross margins are, and then what is your fixed? And really isolate those and be able to play with those and see what those percentages are. And again, hopefully there's some industry industry standards. Um, because as we know, I mean, fixed expense is kind of like the stair step in business, right? You got to make these large kind of chunk investments and revenue kind of goes like this. So you have these pinches that happen between fixed expense and revenue, and then kind of you ride out revenue while you leverage that same fixed expense, and you got to make that next fixed expense, right? And then kind of gets back to revenue and squeezes it a bit. Um, so just getting a real handle on that is um, is really critical. Um, and, you know, just, just look at, I mean, isolate and just get target percentages. Just get really granular. Try not to lump, you know, you don't want to get too granular in your chart of accounts, but try and break out things so you can really see, you know, what is the, the trending um, and, you know, what are certain aspects of your costs that that maybe you've had lumped in together that you're not seeing um, in a separate format. The other thing I'd recommend is is different profit, you know, divisions in, in the business. I see a lot of times companies, they lump things together and one division is hemorrhaging cash and the other one is doing really well and it's subsidizing that one because they haven't blended together. They have no idea where they could say, oh, this is the area that we need to cut. It's actually costing the business a ton of money and focus on the other area. Um, so those are just a couple of quick things. Benchmark to your industry. Understand exactly where your targets are. Try to beat them. Isolate fixed and variable expenses out so you can really see those and, and have that done in your in your chart of accounts. A lot of times accountants, right? You know, they do just, they're more about the tax and, and so forth. They're not really true financial accounting and understanding how your margins are, you know, kind of structured. And then separate out different profit divisions as well uh, to kind of isolate and see or some doing better than others or maybe some subsidizing losses. Next question, Robin Turpin. Um, question asked, time management. What time management system or process do you use and why? Business background, I want to be as productive as I can be. And other software and good old-fashioned day planners, what are you using today to stay efficient and manage your time? Thank you so much. I would say for teams, we use Time Doctor um, in, in our business. Um, it is one that, that, that kind of captures uh, the screen, and it also you can create buckets of activity. So in Time Doctor, you can go on there and say, these are the different 10 buckets of things that I do so that as you're working, you can actually kind of you know, hit that category and track time and organize it in that. And you can kind of see over time how you're spending time in those different you know, categories. That's good for you to do a personal audit you know, with staff to kind of understand. And some of them may feel like, oh, you're looking over my shoulder. Or why are we tracking all this? Just say, look, I want to help you optimize and where you can put your best value in the business. Um, and and use it, you know, explain it. And that's the truth, right? As far as what you're trying to accomplish. Um, but also if you feel like somebody's not being productive or performing or what have you, but it's, it's really kind of what it is. I mean, ideally you have trust with your employees that it's a results only work environment is a lot of kind of what we do as well Is like, look, we can tell things are, if we're getting the results that we need, right? I don't need to granularly track every single thing that you're doing. But, um, but that's kind of more from a team management standpoint for, for personally, maybe for you, for the team is I do time blocking um, I've just gotten aware, I use Calendly, that, that I let people book calls with me. Um, it's a link I send, they can book a call, but I control what parts of my calendar are available. And there's just certain days, and, I, and as I get more and more in a role of visionary and grow and get, and, you know, I'm, I'm really kind of out of day-to-day -day operations kind of at this point, um, is I block my time from like 8 to 12, um, you know, 
uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, Monday through Thursday, 8 to 12, and I have specific activities that I do in those time blocks so that I can isolate my time and just focus. Nobody can, can book in those times. So like you know, Tuesday, I do nothing but, you know, uh, you know, financial kind of related activities. You know, Wednesday is all content creation, um, which is what I spend a lot of time doing these days, whether I'm, I'm working on a, on a podcast um, or working on a piece of content that I'm personally writing. I mean, I have VAs and I outsource a lot of my content writing, but there are certain things I'm working on. Um, but I just block off those key times. And if there's big quarterly goals that we're focusing on, right, I block off time in my calendar that, you know, come heck or high water, right, from, you know, 9 to 11 on Thursdays, I'm on those two hours, I'm shutting everything else down, and I'm doing nothing but working on advancing that activities towards that key quarterly goal. Um, so those are some things that have worked for me. Next submitter is Sarah Hamilton. Uh, how do I build loyalty with my team? Uh, I own a female-run and operated barbershop. Uh, over the years, I've had the countless barbers screw me over in all kinds of areas. They, uh, the way they talk to me, the way they don't follow processes, they quit on me. I can't seem to find a solution. This industry is very unique, and I'm looking for any ideas to make sure that I'm being the right leader to keep people and grow. How do I know if I'm the problem and I'm not doing my job right, or is it just people will be people? Uh, so, Sarah, uh, you know, employees and culture are just um, – they're challenging, um, but as cliche as they are, people talk about culture and the mission and core values, and they've got them up on their wall, and they're nice on, on a piece of paper, but they don't, they don't really live in, you know, and, and breathe them, um, and, you know, this is something I've been fanatical about, and frankly, I've, you know, had no choice. I mean, having to grow a business on the other side of the world, especially during COVID, when I can't be there, you know, we live and breathe culture. Um, if you go to our website, outsourceaccess.com forward slash culture, you'll see a lot of the things that, that we do and that are hyper, hyper intentional around this that that address um engagement so a couple of things I'd, I'd recommend um you know I'm, I'm a huge jim collins fan um and another thing i got a ton of stuff on my site if you go to outsourceaccess.com forward slash jim collins i actually have a summary curriculum that i created there because i'm fanatical about what he shares and they are timeless best practices or how to build and grow a business and i've kind of consolidated all the stuff from his best books um, leveraging his website in a, in a curriculum there but one of the things he talks about is level five leadership, right? Is it's disciplined people doing with disciplined thought, performing disciplined action. And the disciplined people bucket is about level five leadership um, and right people, right seats. And, you know, you've got to set all the examples. Um, and the difference, you know, he talks about different levels of leadership and the difference between a level four leader, who's a great, great leader, right? And level five is humility and humbleness, right? Um, and being, you know, kind of purpose driven. Um, when he when he studied over 1,400 companies in good to great and only 11 met the criteria and he studied you know, amazing leaders, this is one of the key differentiators that, that they found was it was there was a, a purpose of what the business was trying to accomplish that they were fanatical about. It wasn't about ego. It wasn't just about money, but, but their employees saw that you know, in them and it made them want to follow them from a leader standpoint. So and maybe you've got this, but I would just encourage you, if you haven't gone through, I mean, do you have core values as a company? Um, you know, our, our spell great, G-R-E-A-T. I'm um, actually inspired by good to great. You know, gratitude, relationship-driven, ever-long quest for, for learning, attention to detail, and thoughtful communicators. Um, and it is a part of our language that we use in everything when we give feedback, when we give praise in our business, um, uh, or negative feedback. It's just a part of our dialogue. So maybe if you don't have that North Star established, you know, kind of what is the mission statement of your business and what are your core values, and it becomes a part of what, you do in the business and everybody gets aligned and agrees to those right so you know if you have an issue with someone it's not you just personally picking on them as an employee it's like hey see that core value we said we're going to be focused on attention to detail you know um you didn't really quality check this appropriately and we just posted a blog that had a misspelled word in the title right um so it helps you point back to those as a north star to establish from a culture you know from a culture standpoint um and do you have a growth path you know, for your staff um, in a direction that they can look forward to achieving individually and, and a, as a team. Um, you know, it's very individualized by industry. Um, maybe see what others in your industry are doing. Um, you know, what are the best practices other salons and so forth to get people aligned? I mean, I know I go to mine. I mean, I go to a place called Roosters here in Atlanta. I mean, it's, you know, and I can't tell. I mean, the, the, the lady I work with that cuts my hair, I mean, she's fantastic, great personality, but I can't tell if there's a lot of team building that's going on in the business. Maybe there is, I'm not sure. Um, but maybe if it's not standard in your industry, maybe you make it standard and, and kind of you know, put in a new curriculum. Be committed to creating an incredible culture, understanding what the whiff on what's in it for me that your employees really care about the most. Um, 
and get them inspired to, you know, do something focused on something greater than, than themselves and just a role. You know, uh, one thing we've done is we, you know, we have a whole nonprofit initiative that, that we do as a business. I mean, we, we buy shoes and educational supplies and, um, you know, we help people during, you know, natural disaster issues and so forth in the Philippines. It's a key part of what we do. We're actually aligned with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So we survey our employees and say, hey, which of these 17 areas are you most passionate about? Most recently, you know, one of the 17 categories is life on land. Um, and so we actually planted 100 trees over in the Philippines and our staff volunteered their time. So something you can do to galvanize your team as well is get something that, that you know, they, you can be passionate about that you want to give charitably in your, in your, in your, um, in your community. And create you know, performance metrics and scorecards that if they're hitting certain metrics, then, you know, the whole team celebrates and wins some big kind of goal or prize or event or outing that you do. Um, and also tie that to kind of your purpose dri driven, you know, initiatives. Um, I would highly recommend exploring EOS, Entrepreneurial Operating System. We implement in our business and it is, it's a facilitator that kind of comes in, but it is incredible. It, it gets your entire team aligned. You create these things called level 10 meetings that you do weekly. And it just creates a vehicle for everyone to kind of voice where they are, how they contribute, a framework to determine right people, right seats in the business um, that I would highly recommend checking out. There's a book called Traction, the guy that started the whole organization called Gino Wickman um, that you can read. But having a framework like that in there can be very, very powerful to help galvanize culture and address some of the challenges you're dealing with. Next submitter is Lauren Saints. What items should I make sure to include in a partnership agreement um, is the question. Does AO have a template, which Sean can address? Business description, I'm opening an Etsy store. My partner and I have verbally agreed on things and are working on a written agreement. Quick feedback on a partner situation. First of all, just ask yourself, if you want, and do you have the right partner? Right? Do you absolutely need a partner, right? And, and what are the material ways that they're contributing to? And I would recommend even kind of creating a matrix of pros and cons and what they're doing and how they're contributing. Make sure that just, do you really, really want a partner? Do you need one? Um, and do you have and do you have the right one? And just really resonate on that question yourself and dig deep. Maybe kind of do a, a strengths finder or culture index or do disc as well. Um, and just really get clear and aligned. I'm in the middle right now of doing this with, with another initiative that I'm kind of working on with a, with a guy. And and he and I had this conversation recently and just um, really just looked at, hey, let's have an open conversation. What are my strengths and weaknesses? What are yours? What are we committed to? And let's put in writing so we are aligned on what we're both agreeing to because things get lost in conversations that you have and so forth. Get it in writing, distill it down, um, and make sure that you've really got alignment on who's doing what, both short and, and long terms. Um, and as far as what all to include in a partnership agreement, yeah, there's, I mean, I'm not an attorney. I've done a ton of these, but when you're looking at partnership agreements, it's, it's in, in the devil's in the details with those, right? And it depends. Are you an LLC? Are you, how are you setting up your 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 corporation? Um, because those have different operating agreement structures. Whether you're a, a, a C corp with an S election or you're an LLC with an S election, um, and I'll let some of the other experts and mentors that are in that in that space. But um, there's a lot of boilerplate things, and you can just go through those together as a partner. It's like, well, how do we want to address um, you know what happens if something happens to one of us, right? Um, what are, what is going to be the, the automated valuation model that kicks in? So you'll have a valuation formula that's got to be a part of that partnership agreement that you both align with. Um, you know, unfortunately with legal, you have to always just deal with the worst case scenario. Um, hopefully you hope that never happens, but that's where you have to write from and think from when you're dealing with legal and partner situations, uh, so that you can anticipate those. And that's the biggest advice I didn't do in my twenties. A lot of times with partnerships, just kind of on the fly, handshake agreements, didn't sit down and really isolate, but, um, but that, that's one key element that you got to have in a, part, in a partnership agreement. Uh, but again, there's a ton of templates out there. And just when you go through it, line item by line item, just like if you've ever done any legal document like a will, and my, my wife and I, when we did our wills and estate planning, like you just walk through one by one and it forces you to answer the questions that have to be you know, contemplated. Some of it's just legalese, but other material things that you got to agree on in your partner uh, structure. Next submitter is Zach Knock. Question. How do you start a training program for employees? What are the bare bones structure needed for a successful program for training? My company, Diamond State Technology, specializes in working with access control, cameras, automation, and security systems for both residential and commercial applications. The reason why I'm asking this question is I'm growing rapidly and I need guidance on how to build a six-month training program for my technicians. Thank you, mentors, for your valuable and replaceable knowledge. Um, so the first thing I would do... Uh, 
whenever you're creating you know training is just take an isolated time to really brainstorm have a brainstorming session with, with all your key staff get in a room right block off half a day full day maybe even um, this will be very important to do the proper groundwork to get training done effectively um, and just brain dump and figure out what should the training be right and maybe even you know with the team create like you're writing the table of contents for a book right what are the modules what should they be organize it maybe even do a value stream mapping i don't know if you've done that before but it's basically where you kind of map out the journey of a customer from when they very first learn about you all the way to when they leave you and by forcing yourself to think about how a customer touches every part of your organization it forces you to think about the protocols and processes at each stage um so it really starts there um before you even talk about what medium or format which i'll talk about in a second it's just really brain dump organize and get all your team involved as well versus you having to kind of do it on your own and maybe you're already doing this with your team but get everybody involved whiteboard it out and say okay here's the seven key categories of training let's come up with the subsections within each one but just kind of crowdsource knowledge within your within your staff to kind of do that initially some of it is is it process driven things about how everything you know do bookkeeping or submit invoices or to you know send a client quote out all the way down to actually installation and technical and what is it going to require is this just a a, a written kind of you know protocol um or is you know this something where you need to shoot a video, like how to do an installation of something that you have? As far as the medium, uh, trainual.com heard me talk about a lot in the past. I know Sean and, and all others in the AO are a big fan. It is a great platform for housing all of that once you get it defined. So you know, brain dump it all out, and you can house it there. You can write you know itemized kind of workflows. You can embed videos in there. Um, once you create it, you know, have a new employee, you just start them on it, and they go through that entire training process. Um, we're using it for very, very robust training in our business. I mean, providing virtual assistance for business owners, there's all kinds of different things they need to learn and understand when they first onboard. And so we kind of have those protocols done in Trainual that, that kind of take them through the process. Um, but, and then you can do screencast recordings as well, which I've talked about. You can do Screencast-O-Matic, which allows you to record your screen, your voice, and your mouse and kind of navigate things. Um, and then you can save those videos and drop them in Trainual. And they've actually got a new version where they actually have that, that resource embedded right in the tool as well. Um, so do the homework first, do the groundwork, really just take time to really brainstorm and allocate. I know it takes away from out there and revenue producing activities and being out in the field, but it will let you set the right foundation, get everybody involved, get everybody's brains connected because they're touching the business and seeing it all from different perspectives to really get a robust understanding of what all the training components are, itemize them, organize it, create a table of contents like you're writing a book, then you know, kind of bite them off one by one, prioritize which ones are most important, they're going to add the most value for the business. And Trainual is a great, you know, vehicle, you know, um, you know, for for doing that. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody for uh, coming and participating in this live, uh, live session. Um, back to doing these on a regular basis, really enjoy them. And uh, as you can see here, I'm actually in my fishing gear. So bringing you some fishing vibes. I uh, haven't had a chance to get out and do that. I love fly fishing and actually going deep sea fishing in the Keys next um, Next week with my dad, and today uh, we actually got a group of us going up to North Georgia and do a little fly fishing, so uh, that's why I'm in my vibe here. Uh, but hopefully you're out getting there, enjoy your hobbies, and I tell you, get this automation and delegation and some of the questions that we've been answering kind of addressed, um, you know, kind of let you dive back into some more of your personal hobbies and things that you love doing. Um, I know I'm certainly trying to focus more in that area uh, as well, and it's where some of the best problem solving happens is when you get out of the day-to-day -day and the intensity and the firefighting and the, the hamster wheel, and you can really elevate into that visionary and strategic direction for the business. That's when you really have an inflection point and soar when you can be in your highest place of high return on time and value for the business. Thanks again, everybody. Again, Brad Stevens, Outsource Access. You guys want to check out uh, our website, outsourceaccess.com. You can see our videos and kind of what we do with VAs. We provide discounts for any AO members as well. Um, you can shoot me an email, brad at outsourceaccess.com. Happy to, to share that with you. Um, but... Till the next time, congrats on everything you're doing. Keep it up.